Welcome to our double keynote today on the impact of CRO, CMO, mergers and acquisitions. After our speakers give their remarks on the trends and drivers of these transactions and how to enhance the client experience throughout the process, we're going to have some time for a free-flowing discussion and an opportunity for audience questions. So please, as you listen to our speakers, think about things that you want to ask them. But first, some introductions. So uh, as Bob said, I'm a partner at the law firm of McDermott, Will & Emery. We're a global law firm with 20 offices throughout the world and over 130 attorneys who are focused on life sciences. Our uh, team deals with issues relating to IP, healthcare, FDA regulatory, litigation, tax, employment, employee benefits, and of course, transactions. I'm a member of the healthcare transactional team um, and have represented many clients in a number of transactional and post-transactional matters. Uh, just a quick plug, McDermott is hosting a Life Sciences Deal-Making Symposium um, October 10th in Cambridge. So if you're interested in learning more or attending that, please um, come find me afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to be introducing our speakers. First up, Neil McCarthy. He is the founding partner and managing director of Fairmount Partners, an investment banking firm focused on middle market and emerging growth companies. He um, has assisted clients in the healthcare and pharmaceutical outsourcing services industries, helping them create and uh, complete transactions throughout the world. Uh, he has significant experience in the CRO, CMO uh, side of transactions. Notably, he was uh, previously served on the board of Phoenix International Life Sciences, Inc., and represented um, it in its acquisitions that built one of the top five largest zeros in the world. So welcome, Neil. Um, and so uh, shall I give the speaker to you or let's bring up our next uh, panelist here first while you go ahead and take a seat. Um, so Saeed Hus Hussein is the chief commercial officer for Alchemy, a leading contract development and management organization with over a thousand employees in 10 global locations. Like many companies in this space, Alchemy has undergone um, multiple M&A activities, uh, being the product of a combination initially of AAI Pharma Services and Cambridge major laboratories, um, and has undergone a recent private equity uh, in acquisition investment by Madison Dearborn Partners. Um, Saeed is responsible for the company's commercial uh, strategy and customer experience. He has over 15 years of experience in the CDMO space, including previously as head of Lanza's chemical API manufacturing business prior to his role at Alchemy. So welcome. And so we will take our seats here and uh, we'll let Neil kick off his piece of the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Could could we um, could we get the uh, presentation in the monitors, please? Okay. I'll just look over there. So so the. Um, Thank you very much for, for, for having me. I want to thank uh, uh, Bob and also Laura and Jerry for, uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, the topic, of course, is uh, mergers and acquisitions in CDMOs and CROs. And uh, I've, short, I've, I've shortened CMO and CDMO into one thing. I hope you don't mind. Uh, uh, background on Fairmount Partners. I think the important thing here is uh, based in suburban Philadelphia, but not an Eagles fan. So don't hold that against me. I know that's not popular here. I do have to admit, though, that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Giants fan, so maybe not much better. Sorry, sorry. Caught behind enemy lines. OK, uh, I can't tell where we are here. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll catch up. Um, All right, so this is uh, uh, CDMO, CRO. These are the services that we think about uh, when we're thinking about out outsourced pharma services. Um, uh, the yellow ones are, are mostly what the CDMOs are doing. Uh, the green to blue ones are mostly on the CRO side, although we see lots of different mixes uh, between the two. Um, 
these are some of the leaders, and uh, apologies to, to uh, Syed because I don't have Alchemy listed as a leader because they don't announce uh, their numbers. I don't also have Asica or Millipore Sigma, who's one of the hosts. Um, but this will give you an idea of some of the bigger companies uh, in the CDMO side. Uh, uh, this is about the top 12, uh, starting with Lanza at about $5 billion, uh, where they had a significant other operation. Um, I included that, so the, the p formerly known as Patheon part of Thermo Fisher is about $2 billion, but Thermo Fisher in its entirety has lots of other things, and that's about $23 billion. Uh, ditto on the CRO side, uh, the two of the largest, um, IQV and LabCorp, are owned by companies that have significant other operations. But I think this will give you a general idea of, of, of who the big players are. Each of these markets, somewhere between 40 and $50 billion, depending on who you ask, and depending on what you include. So they're fairly large markets. Um, 25 years ago, you would have been in the top 10 of each of those markets with about $50 million worth of sales. Pharma didn't outsource very much back in those days. Uh, and so these, these two 40 to $60 billion markets have, have developed, uh, I think, quite nicely over time. Um, I want to give you an idea of the valuations of these businesses. Um, public companies are often quoted in their earnings per share, but the way we think about it, because there's so much noise between uh, the earnings per share, depending on uh, taxes, depending on depreciation, uh, many investors for the public companies and also uh, for the private companies value companies on the basis of EBITDA. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, here are the public CROs. Uh, the average public CRO is trading at about 17 times EBITDA. So if it's making 100 million of EBITDA, it's trading at 1.7 billion valuation on average. You can see there is uh, some variation among those. Uh, LabCorp down at 11 times because the vast majority of LabCorp, LabCorp's business is not a CRO, it's diagnostic laboratories. Um, but even among the pure CROs, there's still a, a fair bit of variation, as you can see. Uh, coincidentally, 17 times is also the average price uh, that the public CDMOs uh, uh, are achieving today. Um, Cambrex a little bit lower, uh, Thermo Fisher a little bit higher, Lons a little bit higher, but on average, uh, uh, these companies are trading for 17 times their, uh, their EBITDA profits. Um, how have they traded for the last three years? Uh, you can see the gray line uh, is, is the average companies, and they've improved in value over the last three years, about 50% on average. Um, the public CROs, the blue line, uh, have improved in value by about 72%. So obviously, if you put money in the CRO market, you would have made a lot more money. Um, and then the, uh, the, the star is the uh, public CDMOs. Uh, if you invested in a broad swath of them three years ago, you would have doubled your money. If we look back over history, um, I think most of you in this room uh, went through the pain of 2000, late 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, when the economy, uh, when the economy um, uh, hurt us pretty badly. Uh, and you can see before that, in the 2007-8 time frame, these companies were trading in the 13 or 14 times EBITDA multiple, a good strong multiple. Um, when, the, uh, when the bad times hit in early 2009, uh, the companies were trading for somewhere between five and six times EBITDA. So that would have been a very good time to buy those businesses. We just didn't know that. Um, for the last roughly 10 years, we've had a steady march upward, uh, a little bit sawtoothed at times. Uh, but right now, at an average of 17, uh, this is the best, this is the most valuable that, that companies in your industry, our industry, if I can, uh, have been for, for more than a decade. Um, and I think that's wonderful, but I think we also have to keep in mind that uh, corn doesn't grow to the sky. 
So we're, we're, we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. Uh, there's only two kinds of buyers um, in, in our world, private equity buyers uh, and strategic buyers. They think of things very differently. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and the reason is, uh, if we look at a strategic buyer, strategic buyers are, are typically playing for a longer term. Um, if you sell your business to a strategic buyer, uh, you're now working for a new set of people and you have to work within their, within their parameters. Uh, but they bring to you a lot of additional things. They bring to you new customers, new people, maybe new services that you don't provide. And the idea in, in concept is that if you sell to a strategic buyer in your industry, the two of you together can be greater uh, than, than, than just the parts. Um, most of the time they want to buy your entire company today. Most of the time they want to buy 100% of it. And your, your risk and reward of being a shareholder of the business that you started goes away. It's done. Um, uh, typically, the success of those mergers rely entirely on uh, integrating the two businesses in a positive way. Um, uh, and and that's, it's, it's, harder than, uh, it's harder than it looks, but that's what success is. Um, keep in mind that if the strategic buyer who buys you, uh, thank you, if the strategic buyer who buys you uh, is owned by private equity, they will sell shortly after they buy you and you'll get to go through the Nantucket sleigh ride all over again. Um, private equity, they're buying you to sell. Private equity is a series of funds. They're 10 years long. They get the money for 10 years from Harvard, from the Massachusetts Teachers Union, from Aetna Insurance, and their job is to invest it one time in a single company they can put more money in that company over time, but once they sell that company, they have to give the money back. And so as a result, private equity has a very defined um, uh, uh, cycle. They get the money, over the first three or four years, they're investing it. Um, over the next two or three years, they're helping the companies make more acquisitions, and over the next four or five years, they're selling. So the average private equity hold time is about three to seven years. If, if your business is bought by a private equity firm in three to seven years, it will be sold, highly likely. Um, some of the other things that private equity uh, um, uh, does is that they, they don't buy 100% of the business they're buying. They typically buy somewhere between uh, 40 to 90%. They leave 60 to 10% in the hands of the owners. And the reason is they don't run businesses. They don't know how to run businesses. They rely on the, the former management team to run the business. And those managers are still in charge. And they may sell from one private equity firm to another private equity firm. And you may still be working there for a very long time. But at the very least, if you sell to private equity, you're probably going to stay for three to seven years um, so that the private equity firm and you can make money together as partners. Success looks like growth. Private equity, uh, private equity wants you to grow your business. They want that organically and through acquisitions. Um, so uh, breaking it down, strategic buyers, four reasons that they're buying. They're at trying to add new services or new expertise or new products they don't have. They're trying to expand into new geographies. They're just trying to add mass, get bigger or maybe they're tra transitioning away from a business that's a hard business to be in. Um, they can pay more because of really, really three things. Revenue synergies. The theory is uh, I can sell, uh, if I buy a new company, I can sell the new services to my old customers and I can sell my old services to the new customers of the company I just bought and that should deliver more revenue. It doesn't always work, but that's the theory. And the other thing is cost savings. Cost savings is maybe purchasing power, um, some duplicate software systems, some, du some, some duplicate managers. The nice thing about, about this business is most of the time, uh, the people who actually get things done, you hire more of them after an acquisition. Uh, the people that typically get fired, 
if you had two heads of cybersecurity, you don't need that in a combined company. That person goes, usually the head of HR, the chief financial officer, occasionally the CEO. Um, but but uh, if the two companies can bring in more money and pay out less in costs, they're going to add to uh, they're going to add to their profits. Uh, and then the cost of capital is is lower. Um, and I uh, won't get into a whole long discussion about that, but most of the public companies in your sector uh, have a pile of money sitting around doing nothing. Private equity guys have to make about 25 or 30 percent profit on their investments every year. Public companies don't have to get quite that uh, uh, quite quite that high a return, and so they can pay more. Um, they uh, the the public companies need to grow, right? Um, if you're a public company, if you're any kind of company, the faster that you grow, the more valuable you are. Uh, it, there used to be a, a, uh, a rule a long time ago, public companies were, uh, the, the multiple of their profits was exactly the multiple of, of their growth rate. Um, that's not true anymore, but uh, it, it makes sense if you're investing in a company that's gonna grow four percent for the next few years and they're making a hundred million dollars and you've got another company that's growing 40 percent they're also making a hundred dollars you'd pay more for the one that's growing at 40 percent and then the last thing the key financial goal for public buyers is accretion um, accretion means uh, there's a little vig in it for me we'd say in new jersey um, so if, if my stockholders are paying 20 times my profits for my business and I can go to your company and buy it for 10 times profits, there's a VIG in it for me. And, and the, uh, the, the technical term for that is accretion. All right. And of course, I haven't switched the slides. Sorry. Okay, so... Um, two recent deals in, in, the, in the CDMO uh, industry. Um, this is really straight from the announcements that the two companies made. So Thermo Fisher, the biggest uh, maker of pharmaceutical supplies, buys Patheon, one of the biggest CDMOs. Capsigel, uh, sorry, Lanza, the biggest CDMO, buys Capsigel, one of the biggest makers of pharmaceutical supplies. They both say it allows us to give our customers a continuum of solutions. Um, the, the, what it means is I can sell more of my stuff to his customers and vice versa. Um, in their announcements, the announcements could have been written by the same person. They both said we expect revenue synergies. In the case of uh, Thermo, we're gonna sell 90 million more stuff than we were selling separately. In the case of Lanza, 100 million more stuff. Um, cost savings, Thermo Fisher, we're going to cut out $90 million of costs. Lanza, we're going to cut out $45 million worth of costs. And most importantly, they both announced it's going to be accretive to our earnings. In other words, we got some VIG in it. Uh, here are some of the, uh, here are some of the most recent, um, uh, uh, larger deals. This is two years of deals. I won't go through all of them but they're all gonna follow one of those four rules. So Charles River bought MPI. MPI does exactly what Charles River does, almost to the T. That was buying mass. They're just trying to get bigger. Um, Covance bought Chiltern. Co Covance is, uh, is a big CRO, but relatively small on the clinical side, much stronger in the lab side. They needed to get stronger in the clinical side. They needed more mass, and they bought Chiltern for exactly that reason. Um, uh, Icon bought Mappy. Mappy is about a thousand person uh, uh, French CRO. I'm sorry, I didn't switch the slides again. Um, uh, Mappy brings uh, real skills in health outcomes research uh, and, uh, and market access. So there it's to add a, a service or a skill that Icon uh, did not have. INC and Inventive merged to form Cineos, um, one of the several examples of two well-known names being rejected in favor of a brand new name that nobody knows. Um, but they've built a very nice mass uh, between the two of them. 
We talked about Patheon Fisher. Uh, Linical is a Japanese CRO buying a US CRO that's going into a new geography, one of the four reasons again. Um, Alta Science is buying SNBL. Um, Alta is trying to build a, a string of services from preclinical to uh, proof of concept. And so that's transformational for them. Uh, the rest of these are all private equity uh, buyers in the space. Um, one of the questions I think uh, everyone's asking is why are there so many deals getting done now? Um, there aren't very many more public companies today than there were 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, when invent, well, uh, when, when several of these companies uh, uh, merge, it's uh, two public companies coming together and we lose one, but another company will go public. The big public buyers are not by and large changing their size or changing the amount of things they're buying. The, the activity is being driven by private equity. And so uh, Paracel, uh, 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 favorite son of Boston, um, uh, sold recently to uh, GTCR in Pamplona. Uh, uh, AMRI, another leading CDMO, bought by Carlisle Group and GTCR. And these are serial buyers. You can see GTCR is in both of those. The Carlisle Group has from time to time owned PRA. Um, the Linden Group has four companies in pharmaceutical services. Um, Avista, they were the guys who used to own Charles River. Um, GenStar has owned PRA um, uh, and ERT uh, and uh, uh, Harlan. Um, so uh, that's really, that's really, I think, where we're seeing a lot of the a lot of the volume come in. Um, private equity, the rules they play by, uh, buy low and sell high, seems obvious. Um, uh, bet on the jockey, not the horse. They don't really care about us as much what the company does as the strength of the management team. They need that management team and they lock them in uh, by having them be stockholders. Um, go for growth. Um, growth gets you a higher multiple. If you can get paid more money for your money, that's better. And so uh, organic growth plus acquisition growth uh, is really what drives that value. And that's why they expand the investment with, with, um, with additional, additional money for growth and additional money for acquisition. And then the, um, they'd like to improve the business with infrastructure. I don't know that they do all the time, but they try. And then you'll see that uh, 10 years is the time limit where they have to give the money back to Harvard uh, and the Massachusetts teachers. And so they're trying to buy it and sell it in less than that to give them a little cushion. Um, but here's the thing that, that, that surprised me. In the world, in, the, in, the, in, in all of the world, there's only about 20 companies that are more than 100 million revenue in your space that are not either public, a couple dozen maybe of those, and all the rest are owned by private equity. So. 20 years ago, private equity didn't own anything in your space. That's what's driving all these acquisitions because the private equity folks are buying the companies in the, in the space and then they're investing in buying more companies into their platform so that they can get that growth. And that's what's driving uh, all this activity. Um, they've basically replaced the small IPO market. Nobody goes public anymore unless they're worth a billion dollars in your space. Um, leverage, as I, uh, I mentioned before, leverage is critical to success. They'd like to borrow a lot of money. That can be, that helps them to make more money on their money. It also is a little bit dangerous. So when things, um, when, when there's trouble, um, uh, these companies can fall over pretty quickly. I think the best example is probably Cetero, who had an FDA issue. Um, that's not what killed them. What killed them was uh, because of the FDA issue, they couldn't pay their bank loans anymore, and the bank took them over and liquidated them. Um, here's, a, here's just a little indication of the cycle, um, and you can see uh, it's color-coordinated, so you can follow it easily, but uh, uh, you can see really seven years is about as long as a holding period as you'll see in there. Uh, probably three years is as short as it gets, um, and and by using this mapping, we can actually tell, uh, oh, sorry, thank you. Sometimes the guys in the back are switching it for me. Um, 
uh, but uh, uh, I should be doing it for myself. So you, you can see the pattern here. Um, uh, we can tell which, which of the guys in the room are going to get sold in the next few years simply by doing this mapping. If a private equity company bought your company four years ago, you're probably being sold right now. So, and if it's seven years ago, you're definitely being sold right now. Um, and, and, uh, and that's really what's driving a lot of this. Um, uh, just a little bit more on, uh, on M&A activity. Um, uh, the average pricing for businesses is about eight to 15 times that EBITDA. Um, I keep saying the word EBITDA. Uh, EBITDA is, we start with your, pro your bottom line profits and we add back taxes, depreciation, amortization, and interest payments. Um, it's kind of like when you sell your house. Two houses right next door identical to each other. One of them has a $100,000 mortgage and one of them doesn't. It doesn't affect what you pay for the houses. If they're identical, they're identical. They're worth the same amount. It's immaterial to you as a buyer whether one has a $100,000 mortgage or it doesn't. Same with companies. You don't care if the company you're buying has a $100 million of debt or not. That debt's going to get paid off at the closing table. Um, and so by adding back any interest that they're paying on debt, we're, we're uh, taking away structural costs that relate to the last owner, and you can figure out what the company profit would be in your hands. Um, second point, PE funds are really dominating right now. Uh, they're buying most of the companies that are being bought. There are still strategics that are buying, but many of them are strategics owned by private equity. Um, debt is still plentiful. This is another reason that the prices are going up. You can borrow money real cheap and you can borrow lots of it. So we can borrow four to six times the profit of a company. So I can buy a company for six times EBITDA without putting a, putting a nickel up. Um, uh, that, that means that if I'm a private equity person, I can easily pay 10 to 11 times for a business and borrow more than half of it in some cases. Um, we talked about industry buyers. Uh, uh, they're looking at synergies, cost savings, and they've got cheaper capital uh, so they can pay more. Um, and then va on valuations, higher growth, niche expertise, or geographic strength, that's what really drives the highest values for companies of, of like, uh, like kinds. Um, I think I'm probably going to wind it up there. I've got a lot more details, but I think... Uh, Probably should leave so I had time to, uh, uh, to come in and talk about what happens after uh, the mess is made uh, of a merger. So, I'll, Syed? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, I actually don't have any uh, slides, so hopefully I should be able to click through it pretty straightforward. Um, but so what I wanted to talk about today, and we had a discussion amongst the group up here about the best way to position kind of the second half of the, the discussion today. Um, and what we, what we had ultimately talked about was after every M&A, and each M&A is done with the best intention. It's either ultimately to add scale, it's either to you know, get certain technologies together, capabilities that are either add scale or they'll you know, come together with the ultimate intent of providing and enhancing that client and customer experience. I mean, that is the goal of why an M&A is done. I mean, certainly there's financial elements um, to it. There's, those are driving factors. But in the beginning, you know, the goal is how and when can a newly formed organization enhance the client experience. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Because certainly every company, every organization, you know, has an external customer that they're serving a purpose for because that in turn will grow the business. But then there's also aspect of, of the internal customer. So I'm going to start externally first. So when you look at what happens after an, an M&A, and there's different buckets of M&A as, as Neil had, had mentioned. But the one example that I'll, that I'll use is when you get smaller CDMOs, you know, they're focused on a certain niche. And one of the first things that happens is when they go and get combined by a private equity uh, firm. 
So one of the most uh, important things that needs to happen in order for that client experience to be enhanced is that right from the beginning, the company needs to make a decision of whether or not they are truly going to integrate themselves and form themselves as a new offering out to the marketplace, or are they going to continue to have those companies individually serve their existing markets and to a certain extent, you know, just kind of be stapled together from a, from a financial standpoint. And, you know, from my experience and from my standpoint, you know, once that decision is made and in the truly successful situations that I think the industry has seen, there's, a, there's actually effort put in place on integration first. And the reason why that is important to enhance the client experience is because, again, I, I go back to why the M&A was, was done. And it's all done for the right reasons, ultimately, whether, like I said, to add scale, to add technology bandwidth, or to add more offerings to the marketplace. But the only way a customer can truly feel that, embrace that, and actually gain positive attributes from it is if the, comp if the newly formed company is actually connected and, and integrated. Because in order for the client experience to be successful and enhanced, they shouldn't have to deal with any of the background noise or any of the inside aspects of the newly formed M&A. And when you look at what a client is going to go through as they embark with this newly formed M&A company, it's every touch point from that first, whether or not it's you know, the, the business card that they get, whether or not it's the proposal that they get, whether or not it's the people that they're speaking to. Are they speaking to one salesperson? Are they speaking to one head of production? Are they speaking to you know, one, one CEO? All those things on one hand, you know, they may seem very, they may, be, may come across as internal drivers, but they directly, in, in my opinion, lead to the customer experience on the external side, which ultimately will drive the businesses as well. So, and, and all these things, I mean, they, they can't be done necessarily overnight, but one of the most important things is that first big splash that a newly formed company makes, they need to right away from the start tell the market how they will be positioning themselves, how they will be, be behaving, and how, how they will be acting. Because if, if those factors aren't put together the right way and presented the right way, then it instead of it all being for good, it actually confuses the marketplace and it confuses the client experience. The other, the other example that I'll share on the flip side of two smaller companies coming together is two larger organizations coming uh, together, as, as Neil had mentioned throughout his uh, various examples. And when you take two larger organizations that come together, I mean, these are organizations that are well-established. They have the appropriate people, processes, and systems in place. So most of the time, they're, they're doing it for scale and bandwidth across a, a certain segment that they're in or they want to be in. And, but even there, you again go back to the soft factors of how are they going to position themselves. You know, do they want these two companies to operate independently, or do they really want these companies to be combined? Again, it can't happen overnight, but they then also have to same the fate. They also have to face the same decision as the two smaller companies that are coming together. So all that ultimately comes right back to what is the strategic direction of the newly formed organization? I mean, as, as Neil pointed out, I mean, there's top line synergies, there's bottom line synergies, and there's always a business case to justify why an m and is, is, is needed and why it should happen. Um, because again, you know, it all starts off with the good intentions. But putting that theoretical deal into practice, you know, really requires the organizations to decide on how they want to address this newly formed company in the in the marketplace. So those soft factors are important. And then the the next the next angle that's very important is then the internal makeup of the of the company. So as as Neil had had mentioned, you know, one of the first things that that happens is well, there's potentially duplication in positions and you know, who's in, who's who's not. Um, but you know, outside of the business case being driven by financials, 
one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that companies are actually successful is the people from within, the people on the, on the ground. So, you know, they, they need to be taken care of first and foremost. So they not only have a, a script for what the merger means, because it's, it's usually done at levels certainly well above them off the ground, but they also need to have the right culture and mindset and support system to ensure that when they're out there delivering for this new organization um, to the customers that rely on them. Because there's customers that both companies have started off with to build up their business, and then there's certainly an expectation to go out and acquire new customers as, as well. So the, the people on the ground, the people at the forefront, forefront they, there needs to be the appropriate culture and, and mindset of post m a just like there was pre m a as as well because if there's any type of hiccup or there's any type of slowness in how the company is being represented out in the marketplace especially the clients then it's not going to enhance that client exp exp uh, experience it's in turn going to turn you into a discussion about how do you mitigate and just think about that for for a second so you have all this positive momentum of an M&A and then the first discussion you're having is how to mitigate you know the client impact i mean it, it just it it doesn't sound right because you're going from actually trying to get more business to making sure you don't lose business um, and you know from my experience and I'll and I'll even share an example from a from an alchemy perspective because we've gone through some of this very recently you know it's all about growth um, and in order to be all about growth, you need to make sure there's the right people, processes, and systems in place, and there's the right culture and mindset of growth. Because it is very different in an organization that's being built for a potential M&A versus an organization that now needs to grow from an M&A. And again, it, it all comes down to that, that culture, that mindset, and how the organization from top to bottom is focused on customers. And you know, one of the things from, a, from an alchemy perspective, uh, the, the mindset that we go off of, and I think this is what has helped us as we've built ourselves, and as most recently we've gone through a, a new sponsorship um, acquisition, is that no matter what, you know, customers are a privilege and, they're, and they're, not a, they're not a right. So day in and day out, the goal, whether it's pre-M&A, and you're just as a standalone company or it's post M&A, you know, every day it should be about how can we go out and provide some type of solution to the, to the marketplace. And that's why one of the, the key examples in, in addition to the culture and mindset being right is as soon as the company is able to publicly disclose what the M&A is gonna be, and you know, and, and this is where you know time is a is a bit sensitive because you can't talk about it too openly until it's actually done. But once it's done, it's it's go go go. So that's why what's very important in the beginning to enhance customer experience is what is the value of this M and A to the customers, to the marketplace. Everyone knows what the value is to the shareholders, to the business, and to the company. And and you know like. Neil had mentioned some of these, they essentially could have been written um, the, the same. It's just a matter of changing the companies of why a deal is done. But what's very important is as soon as it is announced that the team is ready to speak about what this offers to the, to the current client base and new client base, and there's no, there's no question that is a necessarily a, a, a stupid question or there's no question that should be thought of as, as too much of a tactical detail because depending on the, the customer landscape that you have, the customer, your existing customers are naturally gonna wanna know whether or not their product is still secure, is there enough attention on it? So that's why in, in my opinion and, and in my experience, it's all about going forward and talking about how to enhance that client experience and customer experience. So you may be working with a, with a client on a certain set of services that you offer, and the M&A adds new services. So, I mean, that it seems pretty straightforward that the natural discussion would be, hey, this is what we can also do for you, but it needs to be in a stepwise fashion because, again, that, 
that client and everyone has experience in the industry. Um, everyone has connections in the, in the industry. So as much as all M&A you know, are done with the, with the best intentions and, and all the positive attributes of it, first and foremost, the people need to be assured themselves, but they also then need to assure the customers that if anything, this M&A strengthens our ability to deliver what we're already delivering, and then that will then pave, pave the way to enhance that client, um, client experience. And then finally, the, the point that I wanted to, to make is, you know, when you, when you look at the success of companies post M&A, and you take a look back at how they've done the first couple of, of years, you know, that's the, it's the first true test of how stable a company is because, you know, you just went through an M&A. It's all about growth. It's all about how much more business you can, you can get. But we all know in this industry, there's, there's volatility. Um, so the first true, in, in my opinion, the first true variable as to whether or not an M&A will be successful long-term is how those first, I'd say, six to 12 months go because those are the, that's the critical time element to ensure there's stability internally and there's stability externally because all eyes are gonna be on that new company because of given all the press, given all the excitement, and given all the, the expectations. So there can be no wavering. Um, if anything, there, there needs to be a lot of solid confidence that can then drive the company moving moving forward. So, I mean, so so with that, I mean, certainly, you know, I wanted to to share that experience, share my perspective, um, especially from a post M and A standpoint. Um, certainly, we're going to get into uh, to a Q and A session at the at the moment. But, you know, from a customer standpoint, um, if there's one takeaway I can I can leave you with is that. If you're in a post M and A type of situation, and I think all people within a in a post M and A situation are in a position of influence, you know the day to day discussion should be focused on how to enhance the customer experience versus how to mitigate the the client impact. Thank you. Well, before we open it up to the audience, I think we'll kick it off with a few questions sure. um, for our panelists. Um, so when you were speaking before about you know, deals in this space and, and understanding all of the, uh, you know, when you go into a transaction, you're going into it with the best of intentions, trying to deal with all of the things you need to do in a transaction as well as do your daily jobs, running mm -hmm. the business. What are some of the most impactful things that each party that's entering into this transaction can do in order to make, um, you know, make the transaction work, turn it into something that looks good on paper to something that actually turns into one of those successful uh, combinations or acquisitions? Charles, start. Yeah, so, so um, uh, I, I think the communications that you mentioned, so I'll let you talk about that, but, but uh, I think the first thing, these are service businesses, right? So we, they're not, uh, we, we're not buying gold mines here where the, the value's in the <laughs> ground. Um, uh, it's people, and I think the companies that we've seen, uh, we were talking about one example, so um, a, a certain three-letter pharma giant, um, uh, begins with a G, um, they, uh, they bought a company that began with an SK, and everyone, uh, everyone at the G company got a certain color badge, and everyone at the SK company had another company color badge, and it was kind of like, which guys are gonna get fired? It's the guys with the red badges, they're out of here. Um, that's, that's obviously not gonna work out real well from a keeping people standpoint. The people in the industry are intelligent. They're mostly scientists. Uh, they've got a lot of experience and your clients are paying for that experience. Um, we had another client where uh, they were buying a company and everybody at the, everyone at the selling company uh, got a pen pal at the buying company. Kind of corny, but um, basically, you know, someone at the buying company wrote a letter to you as, as the new member of the team saying, 
hey, this is what I like to do. This is what I'm all about outside of work. And you know, what, what, are, what you know, how, how are things going with you? And they, they, they open the communications. And that was a nice way of, of welcoming the people and saying, hey, we, we hope you stay. We hope you enjoy working here. Because you, can, you know, I mean, most of the people in our industry can find another job pretty easily. So, so um, uh, welcoming the people, keeping the people, and I—that's uh, one of the things I like about this industry is almost every deal. I mean, we've sold four businesses to Charles River, for instance, here in town. They haven't fired a single person as a as a outcome of that acquisition. Not to say that they didn't fire anyone after that, but every single person that. The CFO, the HR, the, the CEOs, all of them were welcomed and kept. And that's a good indication of, of what I like about your industry. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, I, there's two points that I wanted to, to make in addition to that. I mean, one is as you're going through an M&A process and everyone knows the, the high level uh, process that happens, especially when you're going through management presentations and there's a ton of financial analysis, you know, and one of the things that's always looked at is, is headcount, but it's looked at in most cases, in my opinion, as a, as a cost, but without that headcount, there, no, there is no company. So, you know, it's very important to take care of, and, and take care of doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that you have to look over and not hold people accountable, but you, have, you can't forget that just as much as I said, customers are a privilege, they're not a right, Employees are also a, a privilege, they're, they're, they're not a right. I mean, there's plenty of organizations out there. Every successful organization is built um, based on the people that are, are in it. So it's a very important factor that, that needs to be taken into account. That's why the communication before, the communication after, internally is gonna directly lead to the growth that everyone wants to wants to see and wants to, to happen. So I, I think that's a, it's a very critical, um, it's a very critical factor that needs to be taken into account. Because, you know, assets are assets, capabilities are, are capabilities. There's plenty of CDMOs, CROs that, you know, you can make the argument technically do the same thing, but what separates them um, are the, the people and how they position themselves and ultimately how they execute in those interactions externally and, and internally. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, it is it is such a human industry. The human mm -hmm. capital is such an important role in that. What are some ways that you can set expectations for the people that are involved, whether that's within the company, uh, uh, people who are investing in the business, if it is a, a PE funder, um, and also for your customers? Um, obviously, everyone understands you know, why people enter into these from, um, you know, what is the impact of the, of the deal from a business sense, but, but how do you kind of deal with that human element of it? So um, maybe if you want to do the customers, I'll talk about the people. Sure. That's the more fun part. Um, <laughs> so uh, you, uh, you know, bear hug, you know, uh, <laughs> literally hug them and say, thank you, know, you're welcome. Because if you're, I've, I've worked for companies that have been sold before, so the first question, when you hear the news, the first thing you say is like, okay, am I getting fired? And if you're not getting fired, the second question is, is this going to suck in some new way that, that you know, like is, is my life going to be slightly more miserable or a lot more miserable? And it would be, it would be nice, and, and what, we, what, what most of our clients do, the first thing they do, I'm sure you guys did it, is, is get everyone in a room and just say, Hey, here's the game plan. First off, nobody's getting fired. Second off, there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities for you, and um, we're going to try and work with you. We're, we're paying you the same or maybe a little bit more. We're giving you the same perks, maybe a little bit more, and there's more room for you if you want to grow in a bigger, in a bigger place. There's, there's that, and, and uh, we hope you all stay. We hope you enjoy it, and I think you're setting the positive tone from day one, and don't tell them until the deal's done. Right, because everyone just worries about it. They just worry until they know what the answers are, until they know I'm not getting fired and things will be at least not bad and hopefully better. I think the, um, I'll get to the customers in a, in a second, but one point I wanted to add is I think the expectation starts from, from day one. I mean, typically a lot of these companies, either there is a, a leadership 
change and then there's a new strategic plan for the company or even with existing leadership, they go through an assessment and then outline their new strategic plan. So I think those expectations start from day one. So even if a transaction is gonna happen four years from today, I think there is no harm in laying out the strategic plan for, for a company. So if you're a, you know, a small, for lack of a better phrase, mom and pop CDMO that is at about 50 million in revenue or so, but you have a plan to get to a certain top and bottom line and then either be a bolt-on or be a platform uh, provider for further acquisitions. I think the, the expectations start from, from day one. Um, and I think that then allows the employees, existing employees and new employees that you bring on to have a chance to see the vision and then they have a chance to decide whether or not that's a vision they wanna be a part of. And then as you get closer to the transaction, I completely agree. I mean, there's a, there's a handful of folks um, that are driving that acquisition that need to be in the complete no, but then until that deal is, is done, um, you know, it doesn't get you know, more broadly announced and discussed, but there's no reason why it can't be prepared so that you're ready to go on, on day one. And those expectations, at least in a PE, whether it's PE in my opinion or a strategic party that comes in, I mean the expectations I think are here is another opportunity for you as employee A or team member um, B to decide where you want to take your career. Because again, I mean, I haven't seen any M&A that isn't being done with the best intentions of some type of growth. So, there, so I, I don't think there's anything wrong in paving the expectation that here is a brand new opportunity to shape your growth as well as the company's growth. And then obviously everyone has a, a chance to decide whether or not they wanna be in it or, or not. Now in the PE world, um, you know, uh, there's opportunities afforded to certain employees within the company to personally invest. So it's a whole new level of expectation and commitment. That's for some people, uh, not, not for others. Um, on, the, on the customer side, and, and again, we just went, went through this um, and there, you know, I, I would keep it pretty simple. I mean, the most important thing is to try to talk to them in parallel or right after. I mean, these are, these are customers that you have confidential discussions with about your product, about their product, so there's no reason why you can't have confidential discussions with them. And the power of that personalized communication to first off share with them the exciting news, but then also to reassure them that this does not change the day-to-day -day goal of their project right away, I think, you know, is a, is a critical factor. It doesn't need to be more complicated than, than that. Great, thank you. I think we'll open it up for a few questions, and I think we might have some folks with, with microphones in the audience. It's hard to tell. Oh, yes, so I think there's a gentleman up here, up front, that has a question. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was uh, informative from both sides, uh, understanding some of the PE side as well as some of the, uh, the other side from the CMO side. Um, I have a question as far as what you feel the value proposition is here, because what we hear a lot in the industry uh, is the so-called one-stop shop. And uh, is, is that what you think is going on here with, for instance, Cambrex buying Halo, the whole Patheon thing, the Alchemy thing? Is that where you're going? And I'll wait for your answer and then have a follow-up to that. Yeah, I, I think the one the one-stop shop. It, it, so it depends on two things. It depends on the combination of services and how good they are, right? Because if the one-stop shop is really really good at formulation and they're horrible at commercial manufacturing, you don't want to go to that one shop, right? You. you you love the formulation, but you don't like what you're getting. Uh, and then the other thing is, is the person buying it, um, there's a company in England called Quotient, and they, they put together what I thought had, just didn't match at all, which was a phase one group and uh, formulation and contract manufacturing of clinical supplies. And you know they said, this is what we're doing because it really makes good sense. And I just said, that doesn't make any sense the manufacturing guy is buying the formulation and the gal in charge of phase one is buying phase one. They're not even in the same building for most clients. 
Um, I was dead wrong. So um, it turns out that uh, if you could do the formulation and then test it in people and then change the formulation and then test it again, you can actually really get great, uh, great uh, information about bioavailability and, and how the drug's gonna work. Um, and they managed to get the MHRA to let them do that kind of thing. And it's been uniquely successful. And even the very biggest pharma companies are buying from them. So, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, it, I still think that one was a hard one because it's a different buying audience. But yeah, I think the one-stop shop, if people, if people want to buy it that way, um, I don't want to buy a sandwich at the same place that I'm buying shoes. So a one-stop shop that sells both, I don't care about that. It's got to be, you know, sandwich and a drink. Yeah, I, I would like that together. Yeah, then you're not big pharma, so that's good. But yeah, there you go. I, and what I, would, what I would add to that is, so I think, in my opinion, one-stop shop isn't necessarily even a, an, an accurate uh, term because to, to Neil's example, you know, just going in one place that technically has stuff you can buy, okay, but I think what the market needs and what can be successful is end-to-end -end services that actually follow a molecule um, through. So, you know, within the clinical space, I think it can work. I don't think it works in the commercial space because as soon as you get to commercial, um, you know, typically it's gonna be with a, a large pharma organization with an established procurement group. Um, and the goal at that point is cost savings versus uh, spending. Whereas in the clinical space, it's all about speed and, and time to, to market. So if you, if, there's a C, if you have a CDMO where you can offer end-to-end -end services that can actually follow a molecule through, um, that is value added. Um, that's proven to be successful in the, in the marketplace. Um, and the biggest differentiating factor as to whether or not it's gonna be successful is whether or not the CDMO is actually integrated. Is it one salesperson? Is it one program manager? Is it one contract? Um, because if it's just a, a, a parent company with an API company, a DP company, um, then that is a one-stop shop where you could go and get stuff um, there but can it really offer you value and can you really follow the molecule uh, through? So I think end-to-end -end integrated services in the clinical space um, works, um, and I think that's the only area it can work in. Yeah, I would agree because I think the manufacturing side, I've seen this bandied about where people are like, we can do both drug substance and drug product. And then I always come back and say, well, are those both on the same site? And of course I say no, and I say, so what's the difference of be about going to a CMO who then ships the material to the clinical place to do the drug product? What's the difference of doing that and working with somebody that's a high quality CMO that really knows their business and then sending it to them what you feel is the best drug product company out there versus going to somebody that offers both and maybe you're not getting the best of services. So that's my take. For me, for my company personally, yeah. I love consolidation. It has driven more business to my company. I hope more consolidation continues to happen because as a privately held CMO, it's an excellent thing for my company. Uh, so, you know, I hope all the private equity groups keep, keep throwing money because uh, <laughs> it's, it's great for my business. So thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. We are out of time. Um, and so as to keep on schedule, I think we have to move to our next speaker, um, but I think um, some of us will probably staying around if you have any questions or you want to um, ask us any follow-ups. But thank you all, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference today. Thank you. Thank you.